Um, we, we don't want to ask a whole bunch of other developers to, to start porting without us actually having it, having it done it, you know, early on in first. Um, we only ask you to do things we don't have any data on. So uh, we just kind of just started with uh, a version of Leopard and 2 that um, already worked on Mac, and we just kind of dived in. So um, a lot of the information here is, is that we learned is, is going to be a presentation. Um, this printing is also going to cover a lot of the Linux tools that you might not be familiar with. We're not going to get into super dense detail. We don't want to you know, bore, that, bore you to death, but uh, we figure a lot of people will be downloading these slides or and looking at them online and you know, be able to you know, quickly get familiar with some of the tools in here. But um, the, the equivalency between Windows and Linux. Um, and also, we're going to cover how we handle the need for getting to GL conversion. Uh, we have a whole lot of builds that uh, are based basically off the same general uh, code base, but they all have various differences in it. You know, and, and trying to change every single build to be native GL would be hard, so instead we convert from D3D uh, to GL. Um, so, the most important thing from, from my personal perspective about Linux is that it is uh, a sea of stability surrounded by all these other closed platforms that are going in all these different directions and aren't always aligned to um, the best thing for, for games. Um, so, Linux is something that uh, developers can can rally around and be confident that you know if there are changes made, um, you know we're going to have a say. Um, the, we released the uh, Steam for Linux client uh, on February 14th, um, and we've been amazed at how well it's grown um, since our beta. Since our beta began, and everything. it's like it's almost equal to Mac at this point. I know that like some of the feedback I got on the slide was well, Rich, you know, 95% of your customers are on Windows, and it's not very compelling, but um, looking at from looking at it from a growth perspective, and that chart is a lot of growth, by the way. Um, that's actually much more than we thought it would be. Um, so uh, I should actually pop back and mention who Valve is. Um, so we are a game developer and digital distribution digital distribution company in Bellevue, Washington. Uh, we're about 350 employees. Uh, we've got about 50 million paying customers. Uh, so that's not like 50 million accounts that somebody signed on one time and then left. It's actually people who value on their account. Um, any day, uh, around noon, we have about 6 million concurrent customers. For a while, Steam uh, was only for games, but now it's actually for uh, tools and uh, just general software products, too. Um, we've also made things like Half-Life and uh, Left 4 Dead 2, Team Fortress 2, uh, Dota 2. So we actually have a, a whole bunch of really cool games as well. Um, so anyway, I should have covered that first. Um, so, one thing we, we've learned in this process, and, and why we think porting is, is a useful thing, is that it can be a really good stepping stone to mobile. So we, we, we tried an experiment where we took a product and ported it right to Android. Went right from x86, Win32, directly to Android, uh, OpenGL ES, and that was really tough. There were way too many variables that changed at one time. And so uh, uh, Pierre Lou from NVIDIA, who's helped us a lot, he wasn't a Linux driver team, he recommended that, hey, why don't you just change one variable at a time? First, why don't you, you know, instead of using Win32 for, for, for windowing, you know, use SDL, uh, which the library will cover in a bit, which extracts away windowing and input and stuff. Um, and then, you know, once you get that working, then port the GL, but still stay under Windows, and then, you know, just change one variable at a time until you're finally on Linux, and then until from, from there, jumping from Linux, uh, GL, with uh, libraries which extract away input and, and, and uh, uh, windowing, going to Android is actually not that hard. So this is one experiment that we done, and we learned a lot from it. Um, from a performance perspective, we've been really surprised at how much overhead it can be in D3D. And I know that Microsoft's done a, a bunch of really good work to make 11 faster, but uh, 9, there's, there's quite a bit of overhead. I've, I've seen this and I've felt it and I've profiled it and measured it. Uh, and GL allows us to get closer to the driver. So our apps are on Windows and Linux. We're talking directly from the user mode side of, of the driver. And that, that's awesome to me. And there's one less company involved in the middle, you know, between me and the customer. So there's one less company that's dictating and, and controlling uh, the API. So we really like having the ability to, to basically go right to the vendor and ask them questions and get feedback and stuff. Um, and of course, I've already mentioned Steam for Linux, so that's why we, you, know, you should consider porting. So what's what interesting thing about OpenGL that differs from D3D is GL exposes hardware functionality not by OS or OS release or, or service pack. Uh, it's just basically part of the driver. So you can access really high level uh, awesome things like uh, compute shaders or tessellation or geometry shaders even on Windows XP. 
So that's really cool. Like, there are a lot of customers or potential customers we have in China that uh, are over overwhelmingly Windows XP, um, so they can't access the 3D 10 or 11 features. And that, that's, what, that's not only cool from like a product perspective, but from a developer perspective too. So as, as graphics engineers, we can uh, we can assume a base level of functionality, and we don't have to like you know funnel everything through Deep Green Eye or, or older APIs. Um, OpenGL is a standard public API, meaning you can go to OpenGL.org, uh, you can read about you know the entire API. There's very good specification for all that. Some of it, you know, honestly, some of it can be hard to read, but there's also a whole bunch of good books and, and stuff. There's an active, a very active, passionate community behind OpenGL, and it's growing. Um, so anyone can become a member of the Kronos Group, which is uh, which shepherds uh, OpenGL. There's a whole bunch of vendors that are uh, a member of that. Um, so another thing that's really really interesting is we've ran into some, some problems or differences between uh, GL and D3D, um, and so we just phoned the vendors and we asked them, well, you know, here's what we're doing on Windows. We, for example, get a device ID from D3D, and we, we take that device ID and we use that to uh, select some initial state, you know, so, so the out of the box experience is great. And we can't figure out how to do that in GL. Like, we can get a driver stream, we can tell, like, what general car we're on, whatever, but we can't, we don't know, is it an NVIDIA for you, for example? Well, um, so the vendors are really open about that kind of feedback. And if one vendor adds an extension and it's proven that, you know, this is actually useful and delivers value, then, you know, the other vendors are pretty quick to, to take up on that. Um, and also, of course, GL is extremely powerful. At this point, it's a superset of whatever functionality D3D11 offers. So, um, and, and in every case that I know about, you know, OpenGL 4.3 can uh, implement pretty much whatever you can do with 11. Um, and, and, and GL has a trajectory. It is a, it is a living API. And all the vendors are behind it. Um, so they're very much encouraged. Like, if they have a new piece of hardware that has this awesome feature, it'll probably be, given past trends historically, it'll probably be exposed in OpenGL first. So, there's one more thing I want to say. So, uh, I've been doing D3D and, and, and console stuff for about 10 years, and I realized about six months into this effort, um, like, wow, I, there's this whole area, this whole world of graphics that you know I, I should have been paying attention to, and I haven't been. I've been using D3D for all this time, and I, I realized like I've been using the training wheel API, frankly. Uh, so I stepped out of the the, the waiting pool or the kiddie pool, and I'm now amongst the experts, and I'm asking you two to, to, to in, consider learning GL, work yourself to GL, um, give feedback to the community. Uh, and so, anyway, that's it. And I'm going to Thank you. Thanks. All right, so uh, when you're boarding to Linux, uh, we kind of found fairly early that uh, there's basically sort of several separable tasks that can uh, all happen in parallel. One is you can basically be porting um, from Windows to Linux and be working on OS issues, and then separately you can be working on porting from uh, D3D to OpenGL, and, and you don't have, like, they're not dependent on each other, which is really great. So the first thing we're going to talk about is basically you know, getting from Windows to Linux. Uh, one of the things that you have to uh, deal with is windowing issues, and we actually went ahead and did um, SDL. Uh, this basically, if you're not familiar, it's a simple uh, direct media layer. It basically deals with um, all of the sort of cross-platforming uh, windowing issues, including basically <coughs> mobile OS as it works um, for mobile as well. It's a C implementation that's pretty close to you know, what we feel like we would write if we did it by hand. Um, and, and it's actually been used for all of the valve ports so far, including uh, the uh, Linux Steam. So. Um, and on, you know, on a lot of the slides here, I've got just a little URL on the bottom. These are just later for when you download the slides or whatever. If you want to download the slides, you can uh, refer to their, uh, those locations for more information. Um, there were file system issues. If you've used Linux, you're probably aware it's a, uh, the file system itself is case sensitive. And Windows is not. And if you're coming from Windows, that can be problematic. Uh, it's not really a big issue for when you ship your game because every game, you know, pretty much ships with uh, some sort of pack. But it can be a problem while you're uh, developing because uh, it can uh, launch your load times uh, pretty significantly. Um, so there's basically sort of two approaches that we found that worked. One was basically to just, you know, just when you're doing a lookup, you just say, "Oh, I'm just going to blast everything to lowercase, uh, including directories below your application root." Um, and then uh, and then use that and slam all your assets to lowercase as well with a script. The other would be to just build a file cache. Um, the first works a little better for dynamic files, the second works just fine for uh, static files. <clears throat> 
So other things that we had uh, that were problems, and you know, Rich and I have been working on this, like I said, for the last year. We, we, I mean, they probably got in touch with me a couple of weeks after they started. Uh, and so we've been working on this. So one of the big problems that we had were uh, bad defines. Like there was all over the code base places where people assumed that if, it, if the code said POSIX or if it said uh, Linux, then it meant that it was dedicated server because they already had dedicated server support on Linux, but they didn't have uh, you know, a client, a running client. And then locale issues were another one that um, bit us. Uh, basically, uh, Windows or Linux, for whatever reason, we found that the users are a lot more likely to change their locale on Linux. And in particular, we found some locales that will insert a space for the thousands separator uh, or for the decimal point. And then when we would do a scanf, we wouldn't be able to actually read back values. Uh, that was really problematic. Um, and so our solution was just to basically blast people to in US uh, UTF-8 which, you know, realistically, you're going to be handling your localization issues anyways. So um, the only catch there is that not everybody has it. And so you just need to sort of pop up a warning and say, hey, you don't have this, and that could cause problems. Please go get it. Uh, other things that we, uh, or other issues, other things that we bumped into, there were um, font problems. So if you, uh, we basically just used a free type in font config. Um, and we were originally supposed to have a third speaker. Mike Sarton was going to be here, but he had something come up at the last minute. He was going to talk about this. Uh, but uh, but basically, you know, you, you, there are libraries available that you can do sort of Windows-like font rendering in Linux. Um, there is still a little bit of work to basically get the fonts to the sizes to line up, and uh, so that, that was an issue for us. Uh, RDTSC is a problem on Linux, although uh, Pierre Lou has uh, hopefully submitted a patch that will get accepted. But um, basically, uh, <clears throat> the problem is that uh, when you're trying to ask for that really high-performance uh, counter, um, there are occasions where Linux will just say, you know, I, I could have uh, requested clock monotonic, but I didn't. So the, the, uh, the, the fix in the meantime is just to use clock in time with uh, clock monotonic. Um, there's uh, raw mouse support, which is like ultra low latency uh, support, um, which is actually something that's not available on Windows. It's something that we offer only on the Linux. Uh, I'm going to say we a few times. I don't want to misrepresent. I'm not speaking for Valve or anything, but th these are the things that we, we've been working on for a long time. So it's, it's hard to, to drop that habit. Um, but one problem is like some window managers basically when you when you grab this direct pointer they also grab the mouse that can be uh, irritating because then all tab breaks and that, that makes us sad pandas uh, <laughs> multi-monitor is also a little less polished uh, than windows but sdl mostly takes care of that for you so um, so the, the, there really were not that many linux specific issues that we bumped into really the bulk of the problems we bumped into were just you know doing uh, uh, d3d to gl so We'll definitely talk about that uh, up here shortly. Um, so on the tool side, uh, 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 Sam Lantinga at Valve uh, worked up this tool, the Steam Linux Runtime and SDK. And this is basically this um, tool. You can freely get it right now. It's, uh, it's already publicly available. And it's basically a runtime that lets applications work on a wide variety of Linux distributions. It um, also makes it easy for you to, uh, it also has all the tools and everything that you need the SDK does to basically build against these. And there are debug versions that are available both for you and for end users. So if you have crashes that are only happening to your customers, uh, you can say, hey, please go get these debug versions and then send me a dump so I can figure out you know, what the heck is going on. Uh, on the tool side, um, everything that you're used to on Windows is also available on Linux. We're not really going to uh, uh, you know, go into all of these, but um, that some of the tools are a little bit ugly, but they're extremely powerful. And um, we'll talk about GPU uh, debugging later. Uh, similarly for Perf, uh, there's you know, basically the usual tools uh, that you're probably are familiar with. And, and, and additionally, there's um, uh, Perf is a Linux specific tool that actually pops up a little console window and does uh, real time Perf analysis and just feeds you stacks like while you're while you're actually running. It's pretty cool. Uh, and another one I wanted to talk about a little bit more is telemetry. Um, hopefully people are already using that, but if you're not familiar with it, uh, telemetry is this uh, performance visualization system. It's written by Rad Game Tools. And it is absolutely on steroids. It's fantastic. This was responsible for us fixing so many Perf problems. Uh, on Linux, so I, I really felt like I had to give them a little plug. Um, it's very low overhead, so you can just leave it on all the time. 
and all through development for all of your users and everything. And it makes it really easy to quickly identify long frames. So what we're looking at here is an actual capture. This thing is being captured while another person is playing. We just turn on the server and it starts catching this log. And we can see that we're tracing basically um, you know, how long frames are taking. And this is actually plotted against uh, uh, <clears throat> a specific bug that we were trying to track down. So we had instrumented for this specific bug. And then once you identify a long frame, you just basically double click it and you get a view like this that's actually showing you for each frame um, what the, you know, what's going on. So we can see here, uh, you know, these zones as they go down uh, and uh, this gives us lots of detail. So we're, we were really, really happy with the telemetry. machine. we'll use this to sort of talk about other concepts later. I just kind of wanted you guys to get a chance to see it a little earlier. Uh, another thing that um, you might be sort of missing on Linux uh, would be uh, the sort of NT symbol path. This is, if you're not familiar with it, this is basically a way for you to get uh, symbols for you know, the multitude of builds you might have, or whatever, you put them all in one place, and then uh, you're able to basically um, resolve, resolve these from any machine you want. Uh, Linux has the equivalent, and you know, the, the details are not real, I don't really want to dig into the details here, but uh, this supported already in GDB, and um, other tools are starting to uh, 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 standardize on it as well. So. All right, so th this is pretty much the uh, big daddy here that we've had to talk about. This is uh, direct 3 to OpenGL. This was really the reason why I, I asked for Rich in the first place, hey man, I really think we need to get the word out here. You guys have something that's you know, pretty clever, and, and I think it will really help other developers. Um, but before we get started with that, uh, we should probably talk about what GL version should you be targeting. And it, there's um, <clears throat> the simple rule of thumb that I have is that it's basically uh, uh, DX level minus seven is OpenGL level that you want to target. So if you're a DX9 application, then you need to support at least OpenGL2. Um, you know, if you're doing uh, geometry shaders, then you're DX10, so you need to support OpenGL3. And then if you're really cutting edge, then you're going to be doing tessellation and compute, so you need to do OpenGL4. Uh, Rich talked about this earlier, but we have a little graph here uh, that I wanted to talk about. Um, what, you know, why this really matters. So uh, what we have here is basically uh, information from the Steam hardware survey. This is all public information. Um, and on the left edge, the, the, the bottom edge is time. The left edge is uh, September 2011, and the right edge is February 2013. And what we're looking at is basically um, uh, the different segments. There's people who have D3D11 GPUs on an uh, OS that's capable of D3D11. Same thing for D3D10, D3D10 capable GP, uh, G, or OSs in the middle. In the bottom, the light blue is uh, people who have a D3D10 GPU, but they are running WinXP, so they can't actually run. Uh, <clears throat> they can't actually run with their DX10 GPU. They have to use DX9 level functionality. And then the bottom two chunks are D3D9. Now the thing that really sticks out here is that uh, as a result of uh, this, this bottom green chunk is actually about 21% of the market. And that's kind of sort of unfortunate uh, that we're you know, looking at, uh, what is it, six, seven plus years of Vista and we still have 20% of the market that just can't play it. Now with OpenGL the situation is very different. With OpenGL basically now begins to pick up all of those users who are on OSs that are only D3D9 capable, we're able to pick them up. And that actually shrinks that D3D9 segment down to uh, less than 4%. Um, and so now it's much easier for you to say, oh, I'm just going to target D3D10+, plus. I'm only cutting out 4% of the market, and that's, that's not so egregious. So the technique that Valve uh, used, the, what, you know, why we're giving the talk, is uh, this idea of 2GL. As Rich said, they already had you know, a rich engine that had shipped many titles that, uh, that knew that it was talking to D3D. And so the idea of going to every one of them and converting them to, you know, making changes to convert them to be GL was uh, pretty untenable. So the idea instead was, why don't we just take, um, and, and in this case, this was completely them, why don't we just take, uh, you know, there are existing D3D code, let's implement um, basically a, uh, a version, <coughs> oh, sorry, let's implement a version that basically uh, is our implementation of D3D in, with OpenGL that it's talking to. Um, so the idea then is that the engine code doesn't have to be aware of which API it's talking to, and in fact, in practice, it turns out it's not. There's only you know, two or three places in the entire code base where we have to check and say, am I really on D3D or am I really on fake D3D? Um, so that, that worked out really well. The application is almost completely unaware that, that this transition has occurred. And we were worried about Perf. Uh, when we started on this, you know, we thought, oh, we might have to accept a 5% or 
percent perfect. So then it turns out we got it to be twenty percent faster in apples to apples testing. You know, so we were we were really thrilled with the results. So major pieces that 2GL uh, have to cover. You know, we have to deal with textures, latex buffers, index buffers. We have to do device creation and uh, particularly filling out the D3D tax structure. That kind of sucks a lot, and we're not really going to talk about it today. But that problem sucks. Um, and uh, shaders. Uh, and 2GL actually handles shader translation as well. We'll talk about that. One of the things that we kind of wanted to uh, make sure that we covered while we are talking about this are the things that bit us along the way. You know, Rich has been doing D3D for about 10 years. I've actually been doing D3D for about 10 years as well. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, and both of us were transitioning to this uh, GL world. And so we got bit by things along the way. And we'll look at some screenshots of bugs that were, you know, the results of us getting bit. But the most, one of the probably most common sources of bugs for us is this, uh, this thing that GL has, this context. GL basically is a C-based API. It doesn't, um, every function, it doesn't work on objects in the way that you think of as a C++ uh, world. Um, and, and when you're talking to GL, you have this global thing that you talk to called a context. And basically, the relationship has to be one-to-one. -one. A context can only be interacting with one thread at a time. If you try and have multiple threads deal with the context, or if you try and have multiple contexts dealing with the thread at the same time, it doesn't work. And somewhat problematically, those calls are basically defined to have no effect, and so they don't even issue like an error, hey, you did something wrong, because they're not allowed to. The specification says they have no effect. Uh, so um, the function that you need to use to sort of migrate this around is called make current, uh, and uh, that lets you basically say, hey, this thread owns this context now, or hey, I no longer, this thread no longer owns this context. The other things that are sort of different is, like I said, GL is C-based, and objects are referenced by handle, which is usually just a, a GL UIT. Um, uh, most of the functions, especially the older functions, don't take a handle at all. They just act on whatever is currently selected, and that's very foreign when you're coming from, uh, you know, C++ uh, and D3D, where you're like, no, I, I see this is, you know, this is the guy, and he, this is the function I'm calling, and I'm calling it on him. Uh, GL supports extensions. D3D has no official extension mechanism. Uh, and then um, GL has basically, it, it can be a chatty API, but it turns out, even though it's chatty, that it, it is actually really, really efficient. Uh, and so, you know, the, the, the guidance is make sure you profile, right? You got to profile. Even, even if the code looks at you like, oh, this is eight functions, and D3D only had three, that doesn't mean it's going to be slower. So just make sure you profile. So in terms of extensions, there's basically multiple types of extensions from things that are vendor specific to things that are you know available on multiple vendors. There's things that have been improved by the uh, by Kronos, um, and there's uh, the uh, core extensions. So core extensions being something where this was enabled for a later version of GL, but it gets um, pushed back down. There's also platform extensions that are tied to uh, the Windows Manager. Uh, the honest truth is that you really want to wind up using Glue or something similar to sort of manage whether you have these things available or not. Otherwise, it, I mean, it, it's not hard code to write, but it's, you know, it just takes a little bit of time. When you're uh, trying to look for things in GL, um, it, we found that actually it's surprising, but you, you want to search on Google both with the leading GL if you're looking for a function or the GL underscore, and you also want to look without um, because uh, extension specs tend to be written without the prefix, whereas the uh, uh, core functionality tends to be written with it. And if you basically search for the wrong thing, uh, you, uh, you'll, you'll wind up finding some forum post where, you no know, offense to any college kids in the room, but where a college kid is like, I don't understand you know, how this works. And then someone else is like, I don't understand that either. You should do this completely unrelated thing instead. And that, that's not really helpful. I wanted to point out that reading specs is it's hard, but it uh, it will make you more powerful than you can possibly imagine. So it's uh, definitely worth doing. Um, and finally, like we said earlier, if, if you don't like where GL is heading, join the Chronos group. And this is just a list of the sort of right now. These are all uh, game companies that are members of uh, the Chronos group. So talking about objects a little bit more in GL. Uh, it has basically lots of different sorts of uh, objects. There's textures, buffers, uh, frame buffer objects, which are um, used to do render to texture. Uh, and the way that it tends to work is basically the current object reference is uh, selected using some sort of selection function, and then the object is bound. And we'll look at a code sample that'll make this a little bit more clear. And then when you do calls, they apply to whatever the currently bound object uh, has. And then objects tend to have basically a default null object that's zero which tends to not be, you're not allowed to change it. 
So here we actually have a case where we say, oh, I want to, I want to, um, I want to change a parameter on a texture, and I so I I might say, okay, let me bind this to texture unit three. Let me activate texture unit three, and then I call bind texture with uh, seven. Seven is my actual texture handle, and that puts uh, texture object seven, which is a two D texture. Excuse me. Uh, it binds it to texture unit three, and then when we make this final call, GL text parameter I, this doesn't know that it's dealing with um, the call itself. We're not saying directly this deals with texture seven on unit three, but it just knows to get routed to the right place. So now when we do uh, filtering with this thing, we'll get nearest filter. Uh, <clears throat> there's a bit of a debate in the driver community. I wanted to have a brief in earlier. Really there's a bit of a debate right now in the driver community about um, these things called uh, GL core or GL compatibility. And uh, we've, there have basically been rumblings from IHVs that they'll assert that core will be faster, but no one has actually demonstrated this. Um, and so basically the way we view it is use what you need. Um, you know, there, there are things that basically are disallowed if you do core, and they tend, some of them tend to be really useful, like immediate mode, which is a really actually fast and cheap way to draw full screen um, quads. You know, so just use what you need. So we're going to talk about some uh, useful extensions that we found along the way um, <clears throat> that, we've, that we implemented during the, uh, uh, or not that we implemented, but that we utilized while we were doing uh, the port. We'll talk about, uh, we'll sort of talk about each of these in general, but uh, let's talk first about direct state access. Um, direct state access basically says, oh, you know, these functions that don't take an object name, let's just make them take an object name, and then we don't have to deal with binding, the functions don't have side effects of changing what other things are bound. It makes the code a little bit easier to read, uh, and so there's less switching needed, and it also, if you're coming from D3D, it's, it's a bit like a warm blanket. It's very comforting that you're like, no, 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 I see this function, it's working on this thing. Uh, so, as an example, um, if we were doing our texture binding example from earlier, uh, what we're doing here is we, we need to in order to be equivalent, we need to find out what's the current texture, and then we basically bind our texture, and we make our change, and then we restore the current texture so that we, so that this block of code hasn't changed the texture state. And instead, what we could do is just say GL texture parameter I EXT and pass the texture that we want to change, what the type is, and the settings, and then we're done. We don't have to do anything else. Um, now, DSA is not available in all implementations. It is available on NVIDIA and AMD. Uh, but I believe Intel doesn't have uh, support for it. But it turns out that it's a driver-only extension. It's just to make your code easier to write. So you can uh, basically write your own code so that it just assumes that DSA is available. And then you can provide your own sort of my texture parameter, IEXT. Uh, and at the beginning of time, when you're doing your function resolution, you can say, oh, whoops, GL texture parameter, IEXT was unavailable. Okay, just substitute in my function pointer instead, and it'll just do the right stuff and then I can write my client code so that it just all assumes that this uh, functionality is available. So another thing we need to talk about is a uh, swap interval. Uh, this basically is vsync. Um, and so you just pretty much you pass a 1, you pass a 0. You can also use uh, SDL to uh, uh, get at this functionality. And, uh, yeah, you can use SDL to get at this functionality as well. Uh, swap control tear is uh, basically an X Xbox style swap tear for the PC. The idea basically is that um, when you're doing vSync, if you make it in time for the vSync, then you, you know, if you're a little before the vSync, then you wait and you stall just like normal vSync. But if you miss the tear, then just, just go ahead and tear. And that way you're not like sitting around waiting for uh, 15 milliseconds because you missed the frame by a second. The tear will be up by the top of the display, so hopefully it's not as offensive. And then you can do something in your application to get back. Uh, you know, in the right place. This was, uh, this was pretty interesting because this was something that was requested by uh, John Carmack. Um, we got an email and a video from him, and we had driver support to him that supported this basically like three weeks later. And then um, within three months, all of the IHVs had support for it. So, another really useful extension is our debug output. Um, the idea is that instead of you sprinkling all of your code with GL get error, which has sort of seven opaque error codes that are really hard to decipher, instead you just provide a callback, and then when the driver detects that there's an error, it calls your callback for you. That makes it way, way easier uh, to, to basically track down issues and bugs. It supports uh, filtering, so it's really easy for you to just say in your application, like, I don't want these types of messages. Um, and you can also insert your own messages. The quality is a little different, but it varies by vendor, um, but everybody is getting better. And 
then I wanted to show a trick here that actually, um, if you disable, for NVIDIA specifically, if you disable threaded optimization, you can put a breakpoint in your R button output callback, and you can see all the way back into your own code. So you can just see exactly who is generating the, the problem. Um, that was really useful for us for uh, several bugs. Uh, here's pretty much just how we wind up setting up our debug output. Um, we wrote a, a simple error callback that just does a printf and just passes the message in. You call gl debug message callback r. You pass in the uh, the, uh, the callback and then you call gl enable and that's it. Now I will get callbacks into my code whenever there's a problem. Uh, some other extensions that we found were uh, useful for uh, memory querying. There's like NBX GPU memory info and uh, GL ATI mem info. Um, G Remedy String Marker is a D3D perf equivalent. There's a uh, Swizzle extension, basically. So if you're, uh, particularly if you're packing UINTs into uh, Vertex components and you have a specific expectation of how they work um, for D3D, then this is much easier than Swizzling the data yourself. Uh, and then uh, finally, um, not for uh, Linux, but uh, the Apple Client Storage Apple Texture range are actually really useful if you're doing a Mac 41. So there were several other sort of problems that we bumped into along the way uh, that we wanted to talk about. Um, there were functional things like uh, texture state issues and handedness, the texture origin difference, and the pixel convention center, which is only an issue if you're on D3D9. Uh, there were performance things. Make current turns out to be really heavy, and there's a driver serialization. And then Rich made, you know, he wanted to make sure that I, I mentioned, you know, make sure you test your code on multiple vendors, because you know the you are talking directly to the vendor, and so it's important that you, you test your code on all of the vendors you're planning on shipping on. So the texture state problem is a, uh, an issue basically, uh, by default, in OpenGL, it stores information about how to access the texture, which is uh, formally called as the sampler info. It's actually stored right along with the image data. And this, this, is, um, this is fine, it's not scale, this is fine, but uh, the problem is that code like this is not doing what you think it's doing. So here what we're trying to do is we're saying, let's find texture 7 to unit 0. And then, and then we use nearest filtering when we sample you know, in our shader, when we sample from that unit, we'll get the data from 7 with nearest filtering. And then we'll, we'll bind it to 1, and we'll use linear filtering there. And then when we sample there, we're going to get it with linear filtering, and then we do a draw. And this doesn't do what we want it to do. What it does instead is it always samples with linear, whether we go from 0 or 1. So there's an extension, ARM sampler objects, that basically behaves exactly the way you would expect when you're coming from D3D. Uh, so now, basically, textures can be accessed different ways through different texture units. The samplers take precedence over texture headers, so if you have one selected, then that's the thing that's going to be used. And this doesn't require any shader changes or anything, which is nice. So now, what we do, we have this code using sampler object. We basically set up our uh, sampler 0 and sampler 1 to be nearest and linear, and then we bind them. And then when we bind our textures, we actually do get exactly uh, the behavior that we wanted. Uh, so other things that are uh, sort of differences that we bumped into, there's a handedness issue. D3D basically is left-handed everywhere, and GL is right-handed everywhere. Um, right-handed being sort of the math convention, but uh, D3D is actually is pretty convenient in this case. And this was one that I've clutched onto as long as I could. But um, the texture origin is also lower left in GL, and so that means you have to flip your coordinates about V. And unfortunately, because of compressed textures, it's hard for you to just flip them at load time. Um, if you've ever had to flip over a compressed texture, it's a bit more work than you know you would prefer. Uh, one thing that we did was uh, we actually render upside down and then we just flip at the end and that solves a lot of the problems here for us. Another thing is that basically GLSL is um, column major everywhere. And I actually just got bit by this earlier this week because it's, it's not just the major seeds, it's everything that you're storing, it's all column major. So when you're specifying data to GLSL, you have to be careful that it lines up the way that you uh, expect it to. And then finally, uh, pixel centers, OpenGL basically matches D3D10 and beyond, um, but it doesn't match D3D9, so you, you have to be aware of that. So we bumped into this make current issue, uh, we bumped into several make current issues, but this one, uh, what we're kind of looking at here is, you can see that there's like text, but there's missing letters. They're like, here's somebody who has a zero ping, they don't have a zero ping, they don't have a zero ping, and, there's, and most of the names are missing. And this was actually because what was happening was uh, we had another thread that was trying to basically update a texture page, but it didn't own the context, and it would make its calls, and then they would silently get dropped on the floor. Um, so we had to you know, make sure to fix that. Maker also can be a uh, pretty significant perf cost. In this case, we're looking at a frame that's uh, got about uh, 20 millis 
milliseconds of time just doing the make current. Make current can be really expensive, so you, you really want to avoid calling make current um, at all after the uh, beginning of time. So single credit is really the best thing to do. And then once we fix make current, you know, our stacks of the more reasonable. Modern OpenGL drivers. Uh, so another problem that we had for Perf was uh, uh, was uh, serialization, driver serialization. So modern OpenGL drivers are dual core or they're multi-threaded. And what that means is that your application is just talking to this thin little shim that's just recording parameters as fast as it can, and then it's transmitting them over. This is actually pretty similar to how D3D works. Um, but, and then, uh, but there's certain calls that basically would, that you can make that will cause the shim to need to flush all of the data that uh, it has and then synchronize with the server thread, and that is not surprisingly very expensive. So a handful of the functions that we know are sort of bad are, are um, the rule of thumb here really is anything that returns a value is probably going to be a, you know, bad. And GL gets also are going to cause uh, serialization. So just like D3D, you want to basically serialize, uh, the, I'm sorry, you just want to, you want to shadow the state. Um, additionally, uh, there's some functions that, you know, we didn't bump into these, but the driver guys um, mentioned them to me, that basically functions that copy sort of an amount of memory that's hard for the driver to figure out. A lot of times the driver just says, you know, this would be easier if I just serialize and do the copy right now and do the work you're asking me to do and then return, but that, that is expensive. So we have a um, detecting driver serialization, actually it turns out is uh, relatively easy. We were hoping to have this checked in before, uh, or in shipping drivers before uh, GTC and GDC, but it hasn't quite made it. But um, basically you can place a breakpoint in our debug output looking for a specific message uh, that, you know, performance warning synchronous call is forcing a worker thread install. And that is, you have caused a CPU GPU sync point. And then with the earlier trick, uh, you, sh you, you, can, uh, you can actually tell our debug output to operate in synchronous mode. And so you hit your breakpoint, and then you just go look at what the other threads are. And one of the other threads will be in the GL entry point. Uh, and you can, and you can uh, then tell who's the offending call. Another thing that we bumped into in GL was the device context creation. It's a little bit more work uh, in GL. Um, the creation of a simple context is really easy. You just create the window and then you create a context. It's really, you know, it doesn't get any easier than that. Um, but if you want core or compatibility specifically, because it's not specified which one you're going to get by default, most of us give you compatibility, but it's not specified, um, then you have to basically do, you have to create a robust context. And that's a few more steps. You create a window, but you don't show it, and then you create a context, and then you query for window-specific extensions, and then you create another window, and then that's the one you're actually going to render with, and then you create a context using the extension function from step three, and then, oh god, it sucks. And then you can finally destroy the stuff. Um, it turns out SDL, uh, if you use SDL, SDL has workarounds for this. You can just use SDL, GL set attribute, and create window, and it does all of the ugliness. And I will actually also point out, this is only one step worse than D3D, uh, in that D3D does not need step, step uh, one. So, uh, <clears throat> so the other thing we wanted to talk about uh, are common D3D idioms in uh, GL. There's vertex attributes, vertex buffers, textures, render to texture, and shaders. Um, we might kind of blitz through some of these because it looks like we have about 11 minutes left and I have a wager with my boss about whether we can finish or not. So, uh, <coughs> it is 80 slides. He was not kidding. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, vertex attributes are basically really simple in GL, but they do sort of highlight this uh, latched state uh, thing that comes up. So, in the first call, we're basically binding uh, what, what is effectively a vertex buffer in positions and we set up the call, and the thing that's worth noting here is that at this point now, uh, for, you know, I call vertex a trip pointer, it remembers that in positions was the thing that's set, so then I can change it later uh, to do multiple vertex buffers easily, and, uh, and now, and, and when I do this in program v3 normal, and I've called a different, you know, I've set up in normal, it's, it's going to remember that as well, and then you, know, you need to do this enable. It's, it's actually pretty straightforward. There are uh, a couple of alternatives to vertex attribute, uh, there's VAOs, which are vertex attribute objects. These are a good mapping for D3D, which makes them sexy. But it turns out they're slow. Uh, they're, and as far as sort of we can tell from first principles, they're just always going to be slow. So we suggest skipping them. There's our, our vertex and trip binding, which separates the format from the binding. The code, this makes the code a little bit easier to read. Um, and uh, you know, the, the, and it's, it, so we, we, we do actually recommend this one. 
So vertex and index buffer creation uh, it turns out really simple. You just basically say, I want to, uh, you know, this is how long the thing is, this is a pointer to the data to start out with, and this is how I plan on using the buffer. It's really similar to exactly how you're probably doing your stuff in D3D. When you're updating, uh, when you're doing updates, we do uh, basically these calls buffer subdata. So we do buffer data to do our data in the first place, and when we want to do a rename, and then we do buffer subdata when we want to uh, when we want to do updates. Uh, if you um, if you're coming from D3D land, then you're familiar with the lock no overwrite flag, and that flag is basically implied if you specify non-overlapping regions when you're doing your buffer subdata. So as long as you're basically using it as a circular buffer, you're just automatically getting no overwrite behavior. And then when you're ready to do a discard at the end of the buffer, you just basically do a new GL named buffer data with the same uh, name, uh, and that will get you what you need. Um, using these is really simple. We've kind of looked at this already. This, this was the same thing from earlier, where we just set up the pointers, we enable them, and then, uh, <clears throat> and then we're good to go. Uh, the second thing that's worth pointing out is uh, GL array buffers in, uh, are, are basically vertex buffers, and element array buffers are index buffers. Um, on dynamic buffer updates, uh, we we had originally had code that said don't use map buffer. We had use map buffer because it maps fairly well to D3D locks. This because it returns a pointer, it causes driver serialization. Um, so and actually, it also probably winds up causing a CPU GPU stall or a sync point, which I'm uh, you know I'm super not a fan of. So uh, don't do those. So instead, you know, use buffers buffers on data. It's much 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 faster. When we do render to texture in GL, uh, that's another common thing for D3D people. Uh, render to texture in GL utilizes these things called these things called frame buffer objects. And frame buffer objects are created just like other things. They have attachment points. You can attach color targets, and uh, there's a depth and a stencil and a depth stencil attachment point. They have to be frame buffer complete to be rendered to. Um, now, one thing that's sort of unfortunate, uh, which is meaningless to you now, but maybe when you're working on GL later, you'll be like. They're, like other container objects, they're uh, they're not shared between contexts. Um, that can be uh, that can bite you a little bit. I didn't want to talk about uh, you know creation, updating, and stuff uh, for frame buffers because it's already covered in the spec. And uh, but the, the approach that we took in D3D9 was basically we watched the bind render target, the bind depth stencil calls, and then we we would accumulate these. And then when it was draw time, and we'd set a dirty bit. And then when it was draw time, we'd say, hey, is that dirty bit set? Okay, let's go see if we already have an FBO that matches this configuration. And if we do, then we'll use it. And if not, we'll create a new one, we'll bind the attachments, we'll make sure that it's complete, and then we'll stuff it in the cache. It turns out this is much, much, much more efficient than having a single FBO and then swapping out attachments on it. When you're swapping out attachments, that causes uh, validation, which is um, was, was a perf problem for us. Um, so another sort of difference between GL and D3D is like in GL, in D3D you're sort of used to shaders and you have a vertex shader and a fragment shader or whatever. GL has shaders, but in order to be used they have to be attached to a program. Um, and programs are linked. So shaders are compiled, then programs are linked, and then you use the program. And this doesn't really map particularly well to D3D, which supports the mix to match. Uh, also, uh, just in terminology, basically uniforms in GL are, D3, are what constants are in D3D. Uh, now, one, another thing that doesn't map particularly well is that uniforms are part of the program state. So when you swap out uh, programs, it also swaps out the uniforms. So you have to do a little bit of magic to deal with that. I wanted to talk about solving the uniform problem first uh, because it's easier. So to solve the uniform problem, you can uh, one way is to just consider uniform buffer objects. You just create one buffer and then you bind it to all the programs, and then you modify the parameters in that buffer. And uh, that way, basically, when you're have effectively made it so that the GL uniform state is identical to a D3D uniform state. The other approach is to basically clap, uh, is to basically keep track of the global uniform state in your code and also keep track of the uniform state per program and just update them. And then finally, I wanted to mention if you're coming from D3D11, uniform buffers are constant buffers, so that, that actually makes it really easy. Um, other things that we wanted to talk about, so the shaders. Yeah, so uh, so the approach that we did for shaders was basically we watch which shaders are getting set, and then again we set a dirty event and draw time. We say, oh, hey, the shader has changed; it's dirty. Um, so let's hash the names of the shaders that have been selected for the stages and see if there's already an existing program that's been linked. And so we just use that. And otherwise, we linked it and we sort in the hash. And this also uh, actually is surprisingly fast. Um, 
Shader translation is probably one of the most complicated pieces we have. And we're going to talk about it in four minutes or less. So you have, basically, you have this problem. You have thousands and thousands and thousands of HLSL shaders, and you need to give GL GLSL that doesn't take HLSL. Uh, our Vertex and our Fragment program are old and basically vestigial. They don't have any support for new functionality, so uh, definitely avoid them when you're looking. Um, but uh, one approach, basically, for shader translation is compile HLSL and get back the bytecode, and then translate the bytecode to a simple GLSL assembly. And this is, this is what we do. Um, so the nice thing about this is that one set of shaders goes public, it can be fast for the existence proof that it's fast, or rich as the existence proof that it's fast. Uh, but the problems are that it can be kind of hard to debug problems. You have to have just a lot of stuff in your brain all at once. It's, what am I doing in this HLSL? Did I get represented faithfully in the FXC? Did I reverse engineer the blob format correctly? Is my uh, formatting correct? Am I being bitten by locale issues? And then you're done, and you're just like, it's just a lot of stuff to try and keep in your head. So um, there's also a problem that FXC, you might want to basically with FXC idioms uh, uh, stuck in your GLSL, and they may be slow. Other approaches, which we, after we were done, we kind of wish we had done instead, are uh, basically Mojo Shader uh, supports SN1, 2, and 3, which would have covered the DX9 stuff that we were porting. And this has been used several times, so it's, you know, it's uh, reasonably trusted. If you're coming from D3D11 um, or D3D10, you can also consider the HLSL props compiler. And honestly, we would highly recommend just doing one of those rather than rolling your own. So I think I'm going to finish. Uh, I think I'm going to be owed that beer. But uh, performance tips, uh, force in line, you, you, these are some of the most called functions in your entire application. You talk to D3D a lot, and you're going to talk to GL a lot. So you're going to want to basically force in line stuff. And Rich also wanted to point out that the, you can basically, with a handful of exceptions, you can keep your call ratio as one to one. Um, so for example, you can use uh, GL bind multi texture EXT instead of calling active texture and then bind texture. Uh, and that just looks like this. It's you say uh, bind multi texture EXT, you pass in the texture unit, you pass in what the type of the texture is, and you pass in the texture you're binding, and it looks just like an E3D call. And you can manage to keep that one to one. Also wanted to mention, uh, make sure you profile. Also make sure you profile and definitely profile your code. Uh, this was a case where we actually, these are all the same call. This was us calling set cursor over and over and over and over again, and it took a staggeringly long amount of time on uh, frames. This is uh, almost the 200 millisecond frame, and nearly a uh, third of it is us calling uh, set cursor. There are some other things, you know, for best performance, you're going to have to write better specific code, but the truth of the matter is you're probably writing it already. You're probably using NVAPI, you're probably using AMD's equivalent of, of NVAPI, and um, the difference is that now, when you're writing vendor specific code, the specifications are public. So you can tell, hey, I wrote this, and I wrote according to spec, and it's not working. This is your problem for sure. You know, you, you have much more confidence. Finally, we have uh, debugging and perf tools. Uh, NVIDIA Insight supports GL 4.2 core and has some specific extension support already, and there's more extensions and features coming. Um, perf Studio and GDebugger are available uh, from AMD, and they work really well. We've used both of these. Code XL uh, and API Trace, which is an open source uh, API tracing tool. Um, and it has some scaling issues, but Val's actually working on fixing those. Uh, finally, um, we have uh, some GL debugging tricks. So <clears throat> this is this cool thing uh, that Rich did to debug problems. What we're seeing here is the left image is actually the D3D uh, game running, and the right image is GL running at the same time. And then the bottom image was being broadcast in real time. Um, and, and composited, and it's just a sign diff. It takes both frame buffers and then just does an add sign, you know, uh, renormalize an add sign, so that we could see specifically where, you know, perf differences or where uh, image differences are. Bam! 11 seconds. <laughs> uh, sorry, there any questions? Um, There's no way that counts for the view, by the way. That's, that's I, the, I disagree. I think it's about time. No, 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 no. Any hey, questions? Oh, we, we've got Rich, and we also have uh, Pierre Lou who can answer any Linux specific questions if you have any Linux specific questions. A question about uh, threaded utilization in the prior. Uh, can you comment on uh, what happens when the application submits a big uh, buffer to, to the prior, like a texture code or something? Uh, do you copy it on the side or do some major tricks in the top and right memory? Um, 
so the driver will, uh, the driver up to some size will basically uh, just copy it right away if it can. If it's too large, it'll, it'll, it'll scroll away if it has to. It basically it tries to do the best thing it can do for Perf. And so one of those is it's trying to avoid dynamic memory allocations. So if it can just kick it up now, then it just kicks it up now. And if it can't, because you've sent it up behind some other textures or whatever, then it says, okay, I'm sorry. I, you know, I, I, it keeps around some temporary buffers and it, it tries to do the best thing it can do for you. Oh, nope, I'm bringing your mic away. Do you have anything for computing? Mention computing. For, um, sorry, what's that? Computing. Oh, for computing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, uh, with uh, OpenGL 4.3, uh, there's uh, support for uh, compute. There's also uh, CUDA interop with OpenGL. Works properly if you're doing that. Um, obviously, we don't work with direct compute in OpenGL land, but um, there's, I think OpenCL also works properly, although I think OpenCL might be sort of in the light. I'm not sure I might get in trouble for that. This might not do that beer that I want. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he says now. Can you tell me in more detail about the performance? You said 20%, but... Um, oh yeah, but we didn't actually have a slide, right. Um, and I have a <coughs> second question as a follow-up. Is, is there any benefit to going DX then? From what you said, is it an OpenGL is a superset, um, it's cross-platform, and you That's right. mentioned the advantages. So, uh, okay, so the first question, the perf. Uh, the yeah. perf testing we did, we actually did so this. We focused intensely on performance. Yeah, we, and for a long time, admittedly, we, we were not performing against E3, not even. Um, so what we did is we actually covered this in SIGGRAPH. We wrote a whole bunch of custom profiling tools. So I, I made a, a batch tracing system that for every GL call or every um, GL draw or blit, uh, we would plot on a line in a large bit video, part of a bit a bitmap on the video, like, okay, well, here's what state we're changing in GL, and here's how long it's taking. And I did the same thing in D3D, and I made these videos that compare D3D versus GL, and we just focused and focused and focused, and some of these problems in video had to solve. Like, some of them were like, we, we can't, we tried all these experiments, we can't do it. So, the D, there's a D3D question. Yeah, so, the, well, the, so I wanted to say the specific 20% was we actually, um, we did this as a separable task. So we actually got OpenGL working on Windows, and we and Valve already has, um, um, uh, for uh, TF2 and Left 4 Dead, they already have a way to basically run a demo that will render the exact same frames. It, it just renders one demo as per as network as packet as fast as it possibly can. And so we just recorded a demo and ran it on both of them, and we recorded another demo and ran it on both of them, and we found Hey, on Windows for both of these with the same code, except that this one we said run with GL and this one run with D3D, we're 20% faster. So we and we feel like it is an apple We get we stopped at 20. We did well also because we bumped into the maximum frame rate of the engine, and we're like, ah, oh, you know, this yeah, is yeah. slipping now. Yeah, after 325. Years. So if I understood, the second question was, is there benefit to porting to D3D? Is that? Is there any benefit um, if you're starting from a fresh application, you should absolutely just target GL. There's no question. Uh, it, it is a more flexible API. It's going to more correctly or more closely let you uh, expose the hardware functionality. And, and actually, I've, I've been spending the last month writing a demo for next week that I, I'm doing things that are just brutally painful to do in uh, D3D, and they were just really trivial for me to do in GL. So if I were starting from scratch, or if I had the opportunity, I would I would absolutely just do native GL. My personal concern about um, going GL in the interview one is it tells the closed source proprietary driver. So that is still kind of an, uh, uh, a brave new world. Yes. <laughs> so I'm not thinking for a video. I'm just thinking like if I have to ship like you know, a AAA game that's going to be played by millions of customers, I have no doubt that the video and the and the open source uh, Intel driver. The closest source one, we're still gathering data on, so it actually could be fine. We're just not sure. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Will the, the, the DirectX OpenGL implementation will be something that you guys will release? So we're discussing that right now. Uh, we have a few options. We have a, a nine layer, which we've actually uh, have already released an earlier version of that, our Mac version. We also have something called Render System which abstracts away 11, 9, and GL. And uh, I think probably more likely that we're going to uh, extract that from our engine and, and open source that. 
And that's still probably months away. So we did a bunch of experiments with Bindless, and for us uh, and Source One apps, um, it didn't uh, help us at all. But it was clear that the bottlenecks that we had uh, were not addressed by Bindless. So if I was making a new app, though, especially if I was going to do some of the stuff that John said with the arrays and texture arrays, and I would absolutely have a Bindless fan. So going forward, by the way, and with our 11-esque style layer, uh, we're going to have a Bindless fan. Anybody else? Go once. Go twice. Thanks a lot. Thanks Thank for coming. You.